Okie doke. Um, thank you. Uh, let me take off from where I was yesterday with regard to higher dimensions. Um, I wanted to show you just the briefest advertisement for the power of extra dimensions uh, in terms of the big questions on our mind um, before switching to the more technical Susie direction. Uh, so this is still a little more impressionistic, but uh, so here it is. The 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 this is what a four-dimensional wave equation looks like. And uh, but 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 now we were led to thinking about a five-dimensional wave equation, which looks like this. And um, So one of the questions that came up is the M4 and the M5, can they not be related? Are they related? Are they not related? And so uh, we can try to explore that by sort of separation of variables, by writing phi, which is a function of all the coordinates, as some function of x5 and some effective four-dimensional field. Uh, so the behavior in four dimensions is just given by little phi or phi phi 4. Um, and, and we can ask. Can this be, so this, this thing here, uh, if, 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 if this thing here satisfies this equation, there, in fact, there it is, right? Satisfies that equation, um, then we can see what's left here by separation of variables. But in particular, I'm going to ask the question, uh, because we are such little fleas compared to the Planck scale, uh, that, that this should be approximately 0. OK, just to quick the math here. So that's how different it is from M5. It's M5 might be non-zero. This is 0. And then it's clear what I'm supposed to do. If this is, if this is the case, then I could just uh, throw this out, right? Uh, so the remaining part of this equation is pretty easy to solve. And it just says that this f is um, Okay, and the, who determines these? Well, remember that all of this is now, after I introduced the concept of soft breaking of a symmetry, we, we are talking about living in an extra dimension, which has, say, a finite interval. It's a finite box. One second. Um, so there have to be some boundary conditions on these things here. And I won't go into it, because in the references, you'll see reviews of all the different ways of thinking about boundary conditions and so on. But roughly speaking, those boundary conditions are going to determine uh, the A's and the B's. Okay? Um, but generically, it wouldn't surprise you to, to know that basically one of these two terms dominates in a typical solution. So, so, so basically, uh, you end up getting something that very crudely, because that's all I have time for for this, this component, um, looks like an exponential leaning one way or the other uh, times this phi 4 effective thing. Okay. So the idea is that if you have some um, small extra dimension, then the characteristic mass scales will be at the Planck scale? Um, yeah, you might well imagine that these M5s could even be Planckian in size, mm -hmm. right? And, and that would scare you because you'd say, look, I'm an experimentally related physicist. and 
I would like to be able to see something. And I'm saying, don't worry, because M4 could be very small. But the cost of that is that the typical solutions have this form. So that's right. Uh, so I guess I don't understand why that is um, a reasonable assumption to make, that those masses will be so large. Um, only in the spirit of the way I framed everything. You come out of quantum gravity by matching. And you say, oh, let me assume that I don't have any very big hierarchies in, any, in, you know, in, in Planck units. I just have no very big hierarchies. Maybe they're a factor of 10 or 100, but there's just nothing else. Everything else, I would like to sort of just come out of some beautiful exponential story. Already, we're seeing some exponential. Yeah, I'd like it to all come out of some beautiful exponential story. Okay? So it's the question we've posed to ourselves. Okay? And, and then afterwards, after these lectures, you can say, I don't like that philosophy. That's great. Okay. Um, but, but what it means is that in this space, different species are going to have solutions that sort of you know, look like this, or they might look like this, or they might look less. Okay. They're, they're going to they're depend on um, these masses that they have for different species, different fields. So you're going to get this kind of structure. And you can ask. For a, for a macroscopic person who doesn't resolve L and just wants to get the four-dimensional effective theory, what kind of structure does this truth, this deep truth, what will it impose on the matched four-dimensional effective field theory? Yeah. Um, no, because it's really a mass. Okay. Um, so here's the, here's the magic here. So there's a four-dimensional effective field theory. and it will contain um, terms uh, that you get by, right? So of course, the action is integral d4x, integral d5, integral dx5. That's the five-dimensional Poincaré invariant measure in the action. But if I, I'm, so, so, the, so the action would have an extra integral d4x. But I'm going to actually do the integral dx5. Why? How, what, how am I able to just do it? Because, because I just know the x5 dependence of all the fields by doing this. right? So I'm just trying to say, what, what kind of thing would I expect? By doing this, I would expect to sort of be calculating the amplitude for interaction depends on geography. You're more likely to interact with somebody whose profile is similar to yours. right? And, and so that comes out where, in the end, in, in the interactions, when I multiply several species of fields together, their x5, these f's, are going to get multiplied and then get integrated. Right? So, so if you want to not skip that step, I'll have f of species 1 times f of species 2 times f of species 3 um, for however many species appear in this interaction. And, uh, and, and this, there, there, you know, is going to be e to the minus the sum over species, and uh, and either the one or the other of the two types of solutions, um, m five comma i x five. Uh, so and then between zero and l. So there is going to be kind of, uh, so th these will give uh, 4D effective couplings. And as you do these, these things, you will get some sort of with exponential suppressions of various types. And um, so let me first take the question and then say what to do with it. Um, what did you mean when you said a species is most likely to interact with another species whose profile is similar? Um, it's this math right here, which is to say, if I want species 1, 2, and 3 to interact, I will have to work out the amplitude for it. The, like This will be the coupling in front. So then there'll be 5, 4, comma, 1, 5, 4, comma, 2, 5, 4, comma, 3. So these are all the effective four-dimensional fields, but they will see the coupling constant as the result of doing this, this integral. And that will introduce various exponentials that have to be integrated. And I'll get various kinds of exponential suppressions that depend on the species entering into the integral. 
Now, you can play with this yourself, but I just wanted to say if I applied it to Yukawa couplings, so I've given in the references a very easy to read paper with references to the older papers by uh, myself, as it turns out. Um, but, but basically, uh, that's why it's easy to read. Um, so, so, I mean, so myself and my co-authors. Uh, but, but that's like telling you a little bit to, to, to walk you through this in a little bit more detail. I just want to get you excited because I'm then switching gears. Um, for example, when you apply this to like, I've, all of these are scalar fields, but imagine that some of them are fermions, some of them is the Higgs. And so we can talk about Yukawa couplings, like effective four-dimensional Yukawa couplings have an interesting structure. Maybe they come from extra dimensions. And indeed, you find that when applied there, that you can easily get for, say, the quarks that these are i and j are the generations of a Yukawa matrix, that the 4D effective couplings look like some sort of 5D primordial effective uh, 5D couplings, okay, but with extra factors that look like this, m i, m5 i plus m5 j l, where, where, where these are the generations okay, or flavors. Okay. Now, for such a cheap, quick mechanism, it turns out that this ansatz, which allows you to get various sort of exponential hierarchies, starting from order one things, like these are order one, this mechanism allows you to get sort of small and correlated in some way Yukawa matrices that are shockingly um, reminiscent of the data. Okay? So, so much so that there are possible that this is what's going on. Okay. Um, but I don't want to sell that as an absolute given or anything. I just want to say that this higher dimensional theory has great explanatory power when it comes to coupling hierarchies, like the Yukawa couplings. Um, now I'm going to disregard, so I've given you a beautiful mechanism that can address Yukawa hierarchy, hierarchy structure and correlation between CKM angles and mass eigenvalues. It's, it's a very beautiful ansatz. Uh, I'm dropping it, but yeah, so in some order, yeah. Uh, I, I see how you're getting the exponential subtraction. Don't you require different masses there? Yeah. As such, is that not shifting the hierarchy from the Yukawa's No, no. So, so let's see what we're attempting to get out. I'm not a string theorist or a string theorist circa 1980 or something saying I'm just going to calculate everything with no input of any sort. It's the tendency that if these MI, think of these M5, these M5s in L units as some dimensionless numbers of order one. But they're order 1 to 10 or something like that. But they get exponentiated. So it's, again, the philosophy I said. You come out of the Planck scale theory, they're out of quantum gravity with some couplings in, in, or masses in various units in, 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 in some dimensionless numbers that are order 1 in some way. But then they get stretched out in some beautiful way that gives you much more significant hierarchies that sort of looks reminiscent of our data. Okay. But of course, to fit the data, I would have to fit these masses. And then you could say, why was it exactly that number? And I'm not, a, I'm not attempting that. I'm not calculating the electron mass to three decimal places. I'm trying to see the tendency. Right? Um, so there's one more uh, thing that, yeah. Um, I guess to complete the story, um, is, it, like, is this high dimension kind of theory well good enough that you know that like, the length L is stable in the sense that it doesn't change yeah. it all over time? Yeah. And it doesn't get like renormalized, or I don't know if that's the right word for it. It's... Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. Who chose L? Right. Is it dynamically chosen? Yeah, so, th so all of this is like literally the subject of my prior, which is also in the references somewhere, that of my prior TASI lectures on extra dimensions. And this L itself is the VEV of a field, right? It's determined. But yeah, true to the philosophy that I've given you, that all are sort of roughly order one couplings coming out of the Planck scale. 
everything can evolve in this kind of exponential hierarchy sense, including L itself. Um, all I'm doing here is it's, it's like a little preview before the movie, right? Um, uh, because I'm only going to make mild use of this, and then I actually want to show you something with equations. And so, um, The last thing I want to say about extra dimensions is that, say for two species, it's possible that the M5 of the, of the two species, L, may be, again, much bigger than one. I don't mean 30 orders of magnitude. I just mean, like, whatever it is, 20 or something. Again, in the same philosophy I've been staying with, which is that the fundamental parameters may be a little bit big or a little bit small, but nothing ridiculous. Okay. Uh, well, then you can see that these exponentials start leaning a lot to one side or a lot to the other side, and that's all I'm drawing here. That's all I was saying. Um, so hang on. That, now, if this, these two species, whatever they are, chi and phi, it means that they basically live separate lives. There's a tiny overlap where they can talk to each other in the sense of those integrals. But mostly, chi can talk to itself very easily, if everything was the chi mass here. And, and, and similarly for the phi mass, okay? the, the, the phi can talk to itself very easily. But the two don't talk to each other. They, they slide past each other in, in this way um, with, a, with an intriguing little bit of possible overlap. And, and this thing, especially in the supersymmetric context that we will later use, is called sequestering. Uh, when Lisa Randall and I discovered the supersymmetric mechanism of sequestering, we argued bitterly over what to call it, because I was quite convinced that it should be called quarantining. And <laughs> Lisa fought back by saying that that just has a bad feel about it, like there's an illness. <laughs> there's an illness. Now, as usual, Lisa was right, because she was seeing 20 years ahead that there was a pandemic coming, and the name would not take. So anyway, she insisted on sequestering. She even brought in some of her friends and said, don't you think this is better than what Raman has got? <laughs> anyway, um, so it's called sequestering. OK. Um, great. So, so this idea that there are species that don't easily talk to each other and slide past each other is kind of an interesting limit of this. That'll come up in the, next, the final lecture. Yes? Uh, where do the boundary conditions come into your could the, the spirit of the way I'm giving it is there sort of like randomly chosen boundary conditions like Neumann, Drischley, or intermediate ones. And there's a certain genericity that I'm assuming in saying everything here. But to really go into it in a little more detail, uh, look at my lectures or, or on the TASI lectures, the previous TASI lectures, et cetera. Um, and this paper that I gave, that, that one, does this kind of level thinking in a, in a little bit more detail. But the boundary conditions, you can, you, if I gave it to you, I said, choose a boundary condition. You'd say, I have to choose something that respects at least four-dimensional Poincaré invariants. But other than that, I can do what I want. And then I'd say, go ahead, do what you want. This is what's going to come out. Okay? Uh, it's, it's pretty robust, is what I'm saying. OK, so now there's a little, oh, so there's one last thing. So extra dimensions are really cool. Why isn't the entire set of lectures about it? And it could have been. It's not. But there's, there's one thing about this incredibly symmetric theory, theory with a higher symmetry. And that is that uh, higher dimensional theories, for example, just do gauge theory, which you know how to write out, OK? Um, just do everything in five dimensions. And just do the standard dimensional analysis to work out what is the dimension of the gauge coupling. And, and they are non-renormalizable. So the gauge coupling in four dimensions, which again, you know how to work out the dimension, out, dimension of the gauge coupling. It's, the, it's a dimensionless gauge coupling, which you know is step zero of proving renormalizability of the theory. Uh, if you do just go through the same exercise in five dimensions, you'll quickly see that it has negative mass dimension, which means that it is going to be non-renormalizable. Now, that's not a problem. It means it's a. You can still do it as effective field theory. 
But it does mean, what, what is the price of non-renormalizability? Not in theorist speak, but physically. Okay. It's not that I can't calculate anything. Or, it's quite a predictive theory. It's a very beautiful theory in general. It's that the theory has got order one couplings only over a short hierarchy of scales, okay? not very hierarchical. A, a renormalizable theory can have order one interactions over a very large hierarchy of scales. That, for almost all operational purposes that an experimentalist would care about, is the only big distinction. Okay? There's lots of fine print, but, 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 but that's it. So yeah, they can do interesting things, but they can only do interesting things at scales of order 1 over L, which is good enough. And then they leave an imprint, which we can still see today. But that's the price of that. Uh, we're about to move to supersymmetry, which will be analogous in some way, but the couplings can be order one coupled over large hierarchies. And that makes it a very special kind of beyond Poincaré invariant structure. Um, OK, so I wanted to change gears. Um, and uh, so the changing of gears also requires saying the following. Um, If you have children or ever have children, you will know that you want to keep the clients happy, but that does not mean giving them what they want. Okay. So I'm not going to give you what you want, but I am going to try and make you happy. What I think would make you happy is that you leave here with a, you know, if you think of the standard model in GR as a unfinished symphony, then uh, that you leave here, but at least you understand the music as having real depth, that you leave here with something that has completed it further, some in certain sense completed it completely, uh, but, but lives up to the majesty of the standard model, as I discussed in my first lecture. Now, the price of doing that is I'm about to switch to a technical study of SUSY. And in doing that, philosophical questions that may come up, I say, should be deferred. OK, to, and here I have to ask you a question. One, of course, to the break between my lecture and David Shee's lecture. And now that David knows that actually everybody's interested in Susie again, and he is actually the reigning expert in the room, that, that he should just give me all his machine learning time and just be. <laughs> and I think David has very kindly agreed to, <laughs> by not saying anything right now, I think he's a good judge. Um, but no, so there's questions we can take of a philosophical nature in that inter intermediate period. And I am perfectly happy after his question time, which, I mean, his lectures end at 5. There's half an hour where people will be asking him questions. And I'm happy at 5.30 to come back here and, uh, and keep chatting with people with all sorts of questions. So what I would say, because we are in a triage situation in some way, is if there are technical questions about what I'm talking about, because I'm doing sort of algebra and da 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 da, then you must ask it. So let's save the question time for that. If there are questions of the in depth meaning of this, et cetera, et cetera, well, that's what I really like doing. And I'm happy to talk to you whenever you have free time. I'll figure out how to be here and we do it. Um, do you know when, when do you guys eat dinner? <laughs> Great after dinner. Before 6 30. Anytime before 6.30. Oh, it closes at 6.30. So fine. I'm, I'm, look, I'm, you wanna, if, you wanna, you, if, you, if, if anybody wants to ask me questions after that, then we'll, let's set up a time and figure out how to do it. I don't know. Anyway, so um, because I recognize, I'm, especially at lunch, we're, we're getting all sorts of questions. I'm getting all sorts of questions. I think you have all sorts of questions. I'm happy to do it. That's what I love doing most, just sitting around chatting. But I want to get through. I don't want the finished symphony I'm planning for you to be unfinished, because I want you to go away and just like feel it. you know. Um, so I don't want to miss a punchline. OK, so you self-censor which type of question you have. Um, but technical questions on like, what, what the hell are you doing with that equation or something, you, you must ask. You cannot censor them. OK, okay so, um, so the first concept is to do, you know, we went from x to x when we had four-dimensional Poincaré invariants. Even 
just, just by writing a scalar field, we already had the symmetry acting on x, and then the scalar field was just an invariant. Okay. It's a scalar under that. That was the dumbest, it was just the dumbest way of finding a way of writing a theory with four dimensional Poincare invariants. And when we went to 5D, it was just the same. It was like, okay, just write the dumbest type of field, but whose argument is interesting, right? The X is expanded now and has a way of representing the higher dimensional symmetry. And that's what we're going to do here. And, but we need to create this appropriate kind of expanded space time. And that expanded space time is called superspace. Okay. And, uh, but now, instead of the X being X, little x and x5, it's, it's going to be little x and a fermionic set of extra dimensions. You can think of these as just conjugates of each other. Um, so the, the main thing is that these are Grassmann numbers. They're, unlike x5, which is just a regular Joe number, this is a Grassmann number. I forget how many n's there are in Grassmann. Um, so these are Grassmann numbers exactly of the kind you learn when you learn about fermionic path integrals, just that kind of Grassmann number, OK? Um, good. You'll see the, the role that all of this plays. You might say, where is this coming from? And you will see within a few lines. Yeah. Uh, what are the subscripts Yeah, so the Grassmann numbers uh, have these spinner indices, OK? So these are still two component spinners. So this is a Lorentz index for a bosonic a regular Joe number, and this is a spinner index. And I'm sorry, I keep breaking the rules um, of filming. Um, so yeah, I'm saying here, that's what I mean. Okay, a spinner index. Yeah, that's important. Okay. Um, so now we can ask. You know, here we said x goes to lambda x plus a, okay, and we could write the infinitesimal version if you wanted. What, what, how does this thing represent the supersymmetry algebra? How does it work? Um, and, and it's easy. The first part is easy. The theta alpha, so under, under the transformation that Q alpha represents, right? Remember that we have these two supercharges, Q alpha and Q bar alpha. So the, the thing that Q alpha represents, you can say, it's just the dumbest thing. It's just a translation in this fermionic coordinate, or this Grassmann coordinate. And, and then theta bar transforms, but it doesn't transform under this Q bar transformation, just to formalize it. But, but theta bar does. OK. So that's incredibly simple. And you might think, there, we're done. Okay, but there's the non-abelian nature of the SUSY algebra that a Q and a Q bar have to anti-commute to give translations. And this question of how, what do you mean translations? How was that going to show up? Okay, um, and we all know what a translation is at the level of this or the analog of this. Um, so, so here it is. This, this is the way it works. This is the magic equation in in this game. Um, and the proof that this is the case is given by first trying writing it out. And so let me just do that. So I'm going to, sh even, even just doing Q, which is to say C, this coordinate shift has to be accompanied, even in, in the X level, by a shift in X, a translation in X in, in, in this way. Okay, but, but of course, this is a mu index, and this is a dangling alpha beta index. But you all know now what to do with that. We use the Pauli matrices and the identity to hook it up. Okay, and, and then just the analogous thing for this is plus i c alpha theta bar. You'll see why the i is introduced. Uh, Um, I'll often think of this as an in shorthand. The indices are just what they have to be. So I'll often say x, and you say, well, you drop the mu index. No, you know it's there. Come on. Now, but, but similarly, I'll just write this. 
And you'd say, well, you didn't show me the indices. And I would say, come on, it's got to be something which is a vector. And it's made out of two spinners. And I already told you how to do that. So I'm not going to repeat it again. Right? So that's, that's the spirit of my shorthand. Yes. Oh, OK. Sorry. So um, is, is this line still visible? Oh, that's easy. There you go. OK, so good. That, that, sorry about that. Because um, everything else I've shown you ever was just me talking. <laughs> now I'm actually starting my lectures. Uh, <laughs> so it'd be a shame if you can't read. Um, OK, so um, great. Now, so, so, so where is the Q in the Q bar? Well, just like we usually write you know, P mu equals I D mu okay, at the level when you say that when you say that x goes to x plus a, if you do that inside a field, say infinitesimally, then of course the a shows up by turning into derivatives, as you Taylor expand, it turns into derivatives of the field. So in that sense, we usually say that p mu is i d mu. That's what you've learned from quantum mechanics. Um, but now, in the same sense, we can say q alpha is just d d theta alpha. Now at that level, that's just like doing what I did here in the case of the Grassmann variable. If this was all there was, if this was all there was, but no, <laughs> there's this as well, there's this as well, right? If I'm looking at how C shows up, C, which is associated to Q, it's showing up here in which case you would have just said that's all there is. But it's also showing up here. And so you're not surprised if there's another term, which is theta bar. I, I guess I, 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 I'm writing it out, not using shorthand, just once. Uh, Okay, because when you do a xi transformation or a shift in xi, it's shifting both theta and it's also shifting x in a theta depend in a theta bar dependent way, as you can see there. Okay, and similarly, q bar beta is equal to d d theta bar beta minus i theta gamma sigma mu gamma beta. I wish I could give the entire lecture like this. It sounds like chanting, just gamma, beta, d mu. Um, I find it very relaxing. Um, that's it, OK? That's it. Of course, you all know how to write out the transformations in terms of how it acts on coordinates and so on. So that's, and how it acts on spinner degrees of freedom, too. So I'm not writing all that out. However, as an exercise, you can check that this satisfies the SUSY algebra. Okay, that if I take this representation on these in superspace coordinates, um, just do anti-commutator of these things. Just you know how to do Grassmann variables, or you can quickly review it from your field theory books. Um, and just do the anti-commutator here and see that all of this thing munches down and gives you this. The I was put there, so you get the I there, et cetera. Okay. Um, that if you take this anti-commutator with another Q, that you get 0, just as required. So, so all of that, this is just saying, I've now represented, you know, what was the defense of writing it out in this intuitive way, talking about coordinates that shifted in this way? It's that at the level of the, uh, uh, the space-time augmented by this superspace, so this, at the level of superspace, we have a way of representing the SUSY algebra exactly analogous to the way that we represented at the level of the space-time argument, the Poincaré algebra, or the 5D Poincaré algebra. OK? That's, that's the purpose of it. OK, so, um, so the dumbest field, a superfield, would be to say 
just take a function of the superspace, the n. That's it. That's a superfield, um, which is therefore some function of little x theta theta bar. Okay. So it's not the only, just like scalar fields are not the only possible field, but they're the dumbest kind of field. This is the dumbest kind, and turns out good enough for everything we're going to do. This is the dumbest kind of field that you can write. It's like a scalar, it's like a generalization of a scalar field, but living on an exceptional, it's a, it's a boring field living on an exceptional space rather than some sort of exceptional fields. But if you, but, but the difference with extra dimensions is if you, if you have a function of x5, it can be a pretty complicated function. But famously, these are Grassmann variables. So if you Taylor expand in Grassmann variables, one sec, if you Taylor expand in Grassmann variables, this thing will stop. Okay, so you can have the zeroth order thing. I'm going to expand in theta and theta bar. Uh, then I'll start with 5x. And, but, but at some point, it's going to stop because there are only two thetas, theta 1 and theta 2. There's only two theta bars, theta 1 and theta 2 bar. So the maximum thing is that you could get something with theta squared, theta bar squared, right? Theta 1, theta 2, theta 1 bar, theta 2 bar times some other field, okay, which... Um, I, I, I won't write out. I'll do something simpler. Okay. And in fact, in fact, hold that thought. Let, let me let me just let me get to that in a simplified way, because um, I am thinking through how to make the simplest non-trivial shot of this. Yeah. Uh, why do we need two Grassmann numbers, theta and theta bar, to describe a single extra dimension? Uh, I'm not trying to do a single extra dimension. I'm trying to represent q and q bar, the SUSY algebra. Okay. Um, so that's the minimum. And we knew that the minimum supersymmetry, if you give me a spinner, you also need its conjugate. So the, maybe part of the answer is that the Qs have, uh, are not Hermitian, just like fermions. Like there's a notion of a real scalar field. But when you introduce fermions in field theory, they're intrinsically complex objects. And therefore, there's a psi, there's a psi bar. There's a Q, there's a Q bar. Uh, because the spinner representation of the Lorentz group, SL2C, <laughs> has the C in it, which is the complex numbers. Okay, So if you want to track it to root principles, that's it. Um, and we should still be thinking of capital X as a, as a five-dimensional quantity. No, no, no. You should be thinking of it as just this collection. Yeah? yeah? OK. The whatever, I, you should, I don't know. The, what does the word dimensionality, it's got Grassmann things in it. It's not very intuitive. OK? Um, but I'm going to try and make it a little more intuitive to say what exactly is sitting in there by first doing one of the special cases of such a field. And that's based on the following even simpler version of superspace, which I don't know what the name is, but I think it's fair to call it chiral superspace to make the algebra even easier. Okay? And, and that is that I'm going to define, instead of x, that I've talked about so far, I'm going to switch to variables called y, where, again, there is y. And so here, here's what it is. There's y mu, which is x mu, but minus i theta theta bar. It's a perverse thing, but let's see why it buys us something. Okay, The algebra will defend the choice. Okay. Again, there's a mu index there, there's a mu index there, and you know how to make that mu index there. Um, but then this space only has, it only contains these two things. So instead of an x mu kind of object, a theta and a theta bar, well, it is a, it is got theta and theta bar in it, but the theta bar dependence is only here. So I'm not allowing the most general theta bar dependence, only this. Now, this has one magical property, which we're going to check, um, which is that under those rules on the far right, you can check. Some of you will be able to check it in your head. Others will write it out. That, that the y goes to y. Um, hi, sorry for the interruption in your regular TASI programming. Um, I'm. Uh, coming to you from the future of TASI uh, by a few months. 
uh, because when I was trying to teach some of the same material, uh, again, I caught a, an important mistake, which I think is a conceptual mistake. And so I'm coming back and just giving you a few minutes of this blooper alert that I had made a blooper and I'm fixing it with the following two slides. And then I'll re return you to your regular programming and you'll continue with the old lectures I gave at TASI for the rest of it. But here is an important mistake um, exactly at the point where I had introduced the concept of chiral superspace, just the Y mu and the theta rather than three types of coordinates, y, x, theta, and theta bar, just these two combinations of y and theta. So you can think of chiral superspace, the set of y's and thetas as a kind of surface inside full superspace. Um, and I was just working out the supersymmetry transformations, um, but I was about to make a mistake that there are transformations of x and there are transformations of this extra funny term. And there were some terms that canceled and some terms that added. And because of a sign mistake I was making when I was doing it, I got the wrong cancellation and the wrong thing adding. So this is the correct thing. If you just plug in the transformations of X, theta, and theta bar that I defined, um, Y transforms like this. There's a two I theta, theta bar because there's a sum of a theta, sorry, theta C bar, because there's a theta C bar term from this and a theta C bar term from the transformation of this that combine to give you this two minus two i. And then the C theta bar terms from here and the C theta bar terms from the transformation of this, they actually cancel. And during TASI, I got it the other way around, okay? So the magic of chiral superspace is what you can see here that y and theta turn into another combination of y and theta which is to say that the chiral superspace of y's and thetas is closed under supersymmetry independent of any explicit theta bar dependence after the transformation, okay? Um, so note that the transformation is non-trivial under C bar and C, so it's non-trivial in the sense that it's non-trivial under Q and Q bar, which is important because they anti-commute to give you the non-trivial translations, um, but it's independent of theta bar. And, and in the original TASI lectures, I said the stupid thing of saying that, because I, I was looking at not theta bar, theta C bar, but uh, C theta bar, okay? Uh, and so everything looked like it was independent of C bar. And so Q bar was zero in this representation, which would have made no sense from the point of view of the supersymmetry algebra. That was just wrong. And, uh, and somebody even asked me, I think asked me a question along this line. And at the time I didn't catch it. And so I'm catching it now. Um, so, so this is the correct answer that the Y's and the thetas, that was the entire point of chiral superspace. The Y's and the thetas are closed under supersymmetry transformation, they go back to some combination of y's and thetas, uh, independent of any transforming into theta bars. Okay, so that's great. And that allows you to define a very natural kind of real superfield. Let me flip slides, there it is. And that's the notion of a chiral superfield. And a chiral superfield is just a special case of a scalar superfield where the scalar superfield doesn't depend on x theta and theta bar in the most general way. It depends on them only in the combination of y and theta, okay? So there's an implicit theta bar dependence there, but that's it. Um, and now this is much easier for me to explicitly tailor expand in theta at step one by writing everything as functions of y Taylor expanding just the second variable theta, okay? So at zeroth order in this expansion, there's some little phi of y. And then I can go to first order in Taylor expanding in theta. So there's first order. And then there's some coefficient, which is 
psi of y, and since they're two thetas, it's a spinner function of y. And then I can go to second order in theta, but of course there's only one combination, which is theta squared, the scalar, right? Um, because it's theta one, theta two, uh, and that's it. And that is a Lorentz invariant combination. And so its prefactor is a, or expansion coefficient is a scalar function again, f of y, okay? But you can bulldoze further and say, look, I do know this y is a trick and the y is really given in terms of, um, if, we, if we go back and, and look, we know it's really given in terms of x minus i theta theta bar. So I could Taylor expand this dependence too, okay? And so let's see that. This phi of y, I can Taylor expand it. At zeroth order, it's just phi of x. At first order, the theta theta bar is being expanded out. And so you get a, a first derivative of phi, and I'll put the sigma there just so you can see it explicitly, um, the sigma mu and the d mu. Um, but if I go to second order in this theta theta bar term hidden inside y, then I know I'm going to get theta squared, theta bar squared. And again, all the indices, the only thing that's non-zero given the Grassmann variables is the scalar combination theta squared, theta bar squared. And so, of course, I'm going to have two derivatives on phi and two of these sigma matrices floating around. But given the way these indices are hooking up, whatever I write is everything in sight here is a scalar a Lorentz scalar. So it's going to be two derivatives turning into a Lorentz scalar. So these sigma indices are going to contract in such a way that the two derivatives form the only scalar that you can make out of two derivatives, which is the D'Alembertian acting on phi. Okay, so that's the messiest of the cases. In the case of expanding the y dependence in the spinner psi, zeroth order, that's obvious. First order, there's one derivative acting on psi. But again, there's a theta theta bar and a sigma matrix, but there's already a theta there. And again, that means there's two thetas, theta, and, and the only thing is the Lorentz invariant quantity theta squared. Um, and then the theta bar, the sigma, and the fermion contract their various spinner indices in the only way possible. Um, and then finally, there's this f of y, the scalar function f of y. And I can expand to zeroth order, that's f of x theta squared. I can't even go to first order because if I do that, I'll get a, a, at least theta theta bar. And I've already got theta squared. I can't get theta cubed because that's zero. So I, I literally have to stop at zeroth order in the Taylor expansion. So that's fully expanded. You see it's got all sorts of terms from no thetas to all the way to theta to the fourth. Um, but, but in a special form, which is this notion of chiral superfield. Um, I may have made a sign mistake or a factor of two mistake here, and that you can just correct by reading, you know, say Martin's, Stephen Martin's review on supersymmetry or any of the other reviews. Um, but conceptually, I hope it's clear that there is this concept of a chiral superfield and of course, it is got its conjugate an an analogy, which is the notion of anti-chiral superfield. <clears throat> so that instead of y, which is x minus i theta theta bar, there's the conjugate notion of y bar, which is x plus i theta theta bar. And instead of y and theta, which is chiral superspace, it's y bar and theta bar which is, if you like, anti-chiral superspace. And you can have fields that are functions of real superfields, which are, however, sorry, scalar superfields, which are functions of y bar and theta bar instead of y and theta, and they would be called anti-chiral superfields. And we need them because they are literally the conjugate of these fields. So the conjugate of these is, of the conjugate of chiral superfield is an anti-chiral superfield. Okay, but other than that, it's very analogous to writing all this kind of stuff out. Um, okay, so at this point, we can start to write down an action, but um, from there on, the original TASI lectures were just fine that I was giving. So I'm going to return you to those. Um, 
sorry for the glitch and uh but hopefully this is now conceptually airtight and you can continue watching the original version thank you called and this is a central part of the mssm even right but i'm just giving you the, the baby version it's called the west amino model um, and, and it's central, and sometimes I'll abbreviate that to WZ, uh, of a chiral superfield phi of Y. Okay, so let's just talk about how you make an action and why you made it that way other than you were told to, okay? So uh, the four, a 40, in 40 Poincaré invariants, 40 Poincaré invariants, how did you make actions? You, you wrote, of course, you wrote scalars, Lorentz scalars. That, you, know, you write some product of fields such that the whole combination is a Lorentz scalar. And, but, but that would still be a function of x, and you need to have something translation invariant to truly be Poincaré invariant. So you need to integrate. Okay. Uh, and that doesn't mess anything up, because this measure here is also Lorentz invariant. It's obviously translation invariant, but it's, it's Lorentz invariant as well, okay? So you have the right measure, and you write the right scalar quantity, and boom, you're in business. And if you go to 5D, you just have to use the right 5D invariant measure, right? That's also invariant. And then you have to have 5D scalar. That's f scalar function of x. Okay, so what should we do here? That's why I went through all of the higher dimension stuff. We, we need a SUSY invariant action. So we need to, first of all, find the analog of this sort of scalar, right? We already know in elementary fields, it's this, it's, it's, um, uh, where did it go? Um, so, so here, SUSY. Uh, Let's, so we, just from Poincaré invariance, we'd say we're going to have that. That's not too surprising. Um, and, and now, in general, we would have the analog of so, something, some, some sort of uh, product, some, something made out of. Um, so in general, it would be this sort of, I'm going to call it scalar or a composite, composite scalar superfield by multiplying different uh, superfields of the type that I've been talking about. I can multiply them. I could multiply a phi by a phi bar. That's still some other kind of superfield. So I can do that. They're all sort of scalar. I haven't put any indices. I haven't put any space-time indices on these. So they're essentially like scalars. But I need to worry about the measure. Okay. And so there are two options that follow from the possibility that even if I have chiral superfields, I can always multiply chiral by antichiral and get something which is neither. So you might say then the obvious thing to do is to do this. Why? Because it's definitely invariant under shifts of that type. This itself just looks like a translation of x, and we already know d4x is translation invariant. So that's good. When you write this, this is really d theta 1, d theta 2, okay, which is the same given that they are Grassmann variables. That's the same as writing alpha, beta, epsilon, alpha, beta. So this way of writing it tells you it's a Lorentz invariant measure. So this is a Lorentz invariant measure, which is a super translation invariant measure, and it's the usual Poincaré invariant measure. So this is like the go-to thing. Like everything should just be this, OK? Um, and you can do whatever you want, multiply superfields here, et cetera. Now, there is another possibility, which is special. So it's, it's in a sense a special case of this, but but I'll but it but it gets its own name. 
um, which is to only do this. Okay, no d2 theta bar. Only do this. Um, but then it's crucial that the things that you multiply together here should only be chiral. Okay? Because you see, this is the same as d4y, right? The difference between x and y is essentially like a translation of x. So, so this measure, these are the same thing. So it looks like whatever you're integrating should only be functions of y and theta. Well, those are products of chiral superfields, no antichiral. Okay. So, so here you could say it's a function of uh, only phi as a function of y. Okay. It should only be this. Um, whereas this thing here is, could, could be a function out of phi bar of y bar and phi of y. Okay. And, and these two things have names. This is called the Kähler potential. And this is called the super potential. And in, in this last case, you should, of course, add the Hermitian conjugate which would be integral t to theta bar of the conjugate of w as a function of antichiral fields. That's, I'm not going to belabor yet. Um, this is a little bit similar to my question before, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself. But I'm, I'm confused about the dimensionality of sort of what we're doing here and kind of how to think about this. Good. That was going to be my next point. That was going to be my next point. Um, you, we cannot use old words for new concepts. So we cannot say that this, what is the six dimensional, seven, eight dimensional, what is it? Because the dimensions are not on the same footing as the usual dimensions. They're fermionic. So it's, you count them however you want to count them, right? There are two Grassmann variables, which are each spinners, and then there's one x mu. But the other side of your question is correct, which is like when we do field theory, it's good to do the engineering dimensions of everything in sight, right? Just, just what is. So you can, and this is an exercise for you, using the fact, using the fact that C has the same dimension as theta, so I can add them, using the fact that x is, is like this, these are dimensionless, of course, that these two things make an x. You can work out the engineering dimensions of these, knowing that d theta is the Grassmann variable associated to that, and knowing the rules of Grassmann numbers which, and integrals, which you should relearn. You can work out what the dimensions of these are. And therefore, I'm going to just tell you that the dimension of k is 2. And the dimension of this, w, is 3. Just like the dimension of the Lagrangian here is 4, as you've long, lived, long since learned to discover. Okay, so, so that's going to be important in restricting renormalizable features of this theory. Okay. Um, so let's just do that. Uh, these are such low dimensions. Oh, and, and the dimension of phi is just like a scalar field. It's, it's, it's 1. Okay, in fact, the, how do I know that? Because the leading term is literally this scalar field that we're going to focus on. Um, so, so actually, so that's the general structure, but the Wessemina one is take the renormalizable case. Okay. So if I'm going to have something that deserves to be here but not already here, it should involve chiral and antichiral. And, it, and k only has dimension 2. And I'm trying to write something renormalizable. And just writing phi bar phi has already exhausted the dimension. So I can't even put in some derivatives or anything like that. right? That's why it's called a potential, because it doesn't even have room for derivatives, okay? at least explicit derivatives. One second. And so, so k here is just going to be phi bar phi. So often abbreviated is just phi bar phi. What, what things are a function of is context 
dependent in that sense. It's, it's obvious from the context. So, so that's it. And there's no room for like, anything beyond that. Um, and, then, and then let's, let's come to W, but maybe I should handle the question first. Where is the, yeah. Not d theta, d theta? Oh, so these are all shorthands. The, the, like this Lorentz invariant is what I'm calling d, d2 theta. No, this is d theta, d theta. But it's alpha, beta, epsilon, alpha, beta. Okay. And given that the theta is anti-commute anyway, that's up to a factor of two. It's the same as d theta 1, d theta 2. So this is actually just a product of all the thetas that you can list. Okay? Um, I should say, I didn't say it, I should say, I miss factors of two here and there. And for obvious reasons, deal with it. Okay? I mean, <laughs> there, there, there are references. Obviously, there are references. Um, I, I don't miss important factors of two. Uh, I reserve myself for important factors of two. Okay. Um, I have graduate students for the other factors. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Trouble is, my graduate student also reserves herself for only <laughs> important factors of two. <laughs> and that leaves us in a pickle. Anyway, um, so, so this W uh, could, could, could be, um, where, where, was, where was my simplified version of this? Oh, it doesn't matter. OK. Um, the W could be, so its canonical dimension is 3, so it's, Lambda phi cubed is allowed with still a dimensionless coupling. There could be what turns out to be a mass, mass a mass parameter like this. There co you're, you could have had things which are linear in phi or uh, constant. But by just shifts of phi goes to phi plus a constant, just redefining this as phi prime you can check for yourself that you can, you can just get rid of this possibility. So just by field redefining phi by a shift by a constant, uh, you can just get rid of this. As long as you have these terms, you can just redefine this away. And this constant is also pointless here, because when you do integral d2 theta, integral d2 theta of a constant is 0. Okay? So, so we, can, we can throw these away, and, and this is it. And I can't have phi to the fourth or something, because that would have negative mass dimension couplings and take us down an interesting non-renormalizable story. So let's just look at this renormalizable one. And all we have to do is unpack it. And we have all the tools necessary by this expansion. This is exactly like all the thetas. Remember how I did the integral over x5 before, where I just knew, the, I knew all the dependence on x5 given by exponentials or something? So here. I know exactly what the theta depend. There it is. All the theta dependence is there. So I can multiply them together, do the algebra, and, and, and just write this out and, and get a theory where I've done the exotic integrals and just have a Lagrangian in front of d4x. Okay? So what do you get? And um, it's not hard to see. The S is integral d4x. Um, so this looks terrible. There are no derivatives. Is this a theory with no derivatives? Well, it's got no explicit derivatives. They're all hiding in, in, when you switch from the y language. When you switch from the y language to the x language, then you see it in all its glory. Okay? So let's just see what, um, uh, what that does. So, when I'm doing this integral d4 theta, okay, sorry, this sometimes is also called integral d4 theta. Now, that doesn't mean there are four thetas and no theta bars. I'm just telling you, I'll put it in quotes, just so you're not thrown off when you see the literature. Uh, it really just means this, OK? This is the logical thing. This is the shorthand. Um, but how are we going to get four theta? Of course, this integral. This integral, in order to be non-zero, it needs to have two. It needs to have theta bar, theta squared, theta bar squared. That's the only thing it'll pick up. So 
let's look. If I'm interested in the fate of this, then I can pull it out. I can pull this out of the phi in the phi phi bar. But then, sorry, sorry, the correction there. What's that? In order to, if, if I'm only pulling this out of one of the factors of phi in the Kähler potential, then out of the antichiral guy, I would have to pull out this, right? And so, uh, or similarly, I could, I could go with this guy and say, out of one of the factors of phi in the Kähler potential, let's pick this out. But it only has theta, theta bar. To get the other theta, theta bar, I'd have to take the same analogous thing out of the antichiral piece. Okay? So those are the two ways that phi could be picked out. And, but in both of those cases, you just get this. Because by integration by parts, you can put it in this form. And by similar thinking, you can do it in your head as I'm writing it out. You, you, you get the Dirac action. But, but the last thing is you, you get this funny thing okay, that is a, seems to be a scalar field with no derivatives acting on it. That's the classic sign of an auxiliary field. And we'll see what it does in a second. Okay. Um, but, but then I have to do this integral. And it's, again, the same kind of game of just seeing that I have to be able to. So here, it's, everything is already in y language. So the integrals are really easy to do. Uh, but I have to get theta squared to get a non-trivial integral. I could get theta squared in one of two ways. I could pick two psi's. That'll get me a theta squared, and then whatever is left. Okay, so, so you can see that that will give me uh, a lambda phi psi squared. Or I could get m psi squared. But then there's another way to get theta squared in the, in, the, in the integrand, and that is to choose f. Okay, and then, and, but having chosen f to get the theta squared, any other factors have to always choose phi. And so uh, that is lambda phi squared plus m phi times f, and again, plus Hermitian conjugate. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if, 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 if classically you can see that you can just solve for f. It's such a simple, you can, like you can, you can classically solve the f equations of motion and the f bar equations of motion and substitute it back. If you want to think like a path integral person, this is a very simple Gaussian path integral to be done over f, which is just trivial and you can do it. It's equivalent to just saying solve the classical equations of motion for f. And, uh, and the net result is uh, integral d4x. And, and of course, I'll just keep the kinetic terms, like these guys, the things that don't depend on f, and, and, and plus the, um, uh, th these terms here, which I can summarize as at lambda phi psi squared. And, and then just doing this gives me, basically gives me a potential. This integrating out f gives me a potential for, for little phi, which is um, minus m phi plus lambda phi squared squared. OK, so this potential wasn't there. It was all muddied up with this f. But once I get rid of the f, this is what it is. And, and so it's often called the f term potential, vf. OK? And, uh, and look what we've got. We've got a theory which has got phi to the fourth interactions, this squared. It's got phi cubed interactions. It's got Yukawa couplings. Uh, it's just great. It's the greatest thing you ever learned prior to learning gauge theory, right? So, so this is something. But notice its significance in terms of the big picture of everything I've been uh, ranting about is that the m goes to 0 limit is protected by, so the m psi goes to 0, is protected by chiral symmetry in the sense that I already talked about at the beginning on the first lecture. But Susie, which is secretly here, 
if you go back to the, you know, put the whole thing back together, it's super symmetric. Susie implies that m psi is equal to m little phi. In fact, you can read that off here, right? If you look at the mass term of phi, it's m squared is the mass squared of little phi, and m is the mass of psi. They're degenerate, exactly as predicted earlier. Uh, and, and so it's also protected. So m phi goes to 0 is also protected by the chiral symmetry and supersymmetry. Okay? But look at the theory we have. It's one of the classic theories, normalizable theories, with order 1 couplings of the scalar even as I go towards the massless limit. Okay? It's not like an axion, which decouples super rapidly as I, be, as I make it lighter and lighter. This thing keeps interacting. Okay? So it's something shocking in the categorization of all possible things in the spinning of tails or the tail of spins that I told you. Um, there's something shocking, a little bit reminiscent of possibly the Higgs. Who knows? You know, that, that something like this would be happening. Um, good. Uh, so I think I should be able to do the magic of, as I told you, supersymmetry is too good for this world. It's too good for all of you. So um, it has to be broken, but because ultimately it's a gauge symmetry, breaking it means it has to be broken spontaneously, and then the Higgs mechanism takes over. So we have to ask, what is spontaneous symmetry breaking? OK? And uh, already, we can, we can just do it <laughs> by going, in the simplest case, just like when you study sigma models of spontaneous symmetry breaking, they might even be non-renormalizable chiral Lagrangians or something like that. So here is a kind of non-renormalizable model of spontaneous SUSY breaking. So non-renormalizable. Okay, and of course spontaneous. Now, in honor of the name sigma model, I'm I'm changing this name to this. Okay, one second, um, and uh, and and of course secretly, it's 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 made out of a scalar field, which I'll call little sigma, and a fermionic field, which I'll call this, and this auxiliary field. I won't write it all out again, uh, which I'll call f sub sigma. Okay, there's a question. No, so there's no gauge symmetry yet, okay. right? I, I, I said this is the best thing before gauge symmetry is introduced. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's not quite realistic, but. Oh yeah, and this is all global SUSY. There's no gravitino here, so I've taken the G Newton goes to zero limit in my head to even walk down this path, right? And yeah, there's also no gravity. <laughs> Um, and you know, in these lectures, I will not put it back. And then in the non renormalizable case, we have all these things you can add to it. Hold that thought. I'm going to give you the answer. Here, here it is. So the non renormalizable theory is just going to be non renormalizable in this sense. where whenever I write a capital M with any other subscript, I mean that it's, a, it's roughly Planckian philosophically. It's some Planckian scale. So it's non-renormalizable, but it's non-renormalizable at a place where you might expect non-renormalizability, the scale of quantum gravity. OK, so that's the way I want you to think about it. Um, and W, so hopefully that answers one aspect of your question. And W is going to be especially simple. It's just going to be this. And in some exercises, I might allow you to allow to write other things that you might want to write. But I want to do the minimal algebra right now by just taking something linear in sigma. Now, I said you could take linear and sigma, linear and phi terms, and field redefine them away. But you can only do that if there are phi cubed and phi squared terms. Here, I'm just writing something linear without phi cubed, without sigma cubed or sigma squared terms. You can generalize what I'm saying to include those. I'll either give it as an exercise or I won't do it. 
but let's just see what does this model do. I just want to say, what does spontaneous SUSY breaking look like dropping all other considerations? What does that look like? So here's a Kähler potential. This would have been canonical. This is non-renormalizable, and then there's this. What does it give you? And um, it's worth understanding the simplicity of SUSY in G Newton goes to zero language, OK? So SUSY, if you look at the SUSY algebra that I've already told you, the one where Q anti-commuter Q bar equals P mu, well, one of those P mu's is, is the Hamiltonian. It's P0, OK? So go back to that algebra and solve for it, and you'll find that H, the Hamiltonian, P0, from the SUSY algebra is just this. Again, this absolute value, I mean q1, q1 bar, plus q2, q2 bar. OK, that's your little exercise. Go check it. It's a, it's a sum of total squares, which means that in terms of eigenvalues, it's positive, what, semi-definite? OK, it's got to be like that. And SUSY breaking, spontaneous SUSY breaking, implies that some q, say 1 or 2, is not 0, right? That a charge, a would-be conserved charge, but the vacuum is not invariant under the charge. That's what we mean by spontaneous, uh, spontaneous breaking. But because both of them are being summed and squared in this way, that is an if and only if the energy of the vacuum is not 0. OK? So if the energy of the vacuum, if the vacuum energy is 0, it means the world is supersymmetric. It's not, Susie is not spontaneously broken. If it's non-zero, which means it has to be positive, then it is not supersymmetric. Um, and so you can just do the same thing I did, expand in gory detail just to understand what, what the thing looks like. And for lack of time, I will just write the answer, but hopefully it doesn't look very um, puzzling where it would have come from. Uh, it looks like this. Um, so first of all, when you, when you solve the F sigma equations of motion en route to going from this kind of step to this kind of step, uh, you find, so if, the, if, 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 if this term was not there, if this term was not there, this would be a very easy thing to do. When you integrate d2 theta of this, you would just get lambda squared f sigma, so that you would have theta squared to, to integrate. So that would just be linear. This would be the coefficient of f. And from here, you would have f bar f. And when you complete the square and solve for f, you would have just said f equals lambda squared. Okay, so you would have just said this. Okay. But now, because I have that non-renormalizable term, there's a correction. And I leave it to you to check that it's just that. And then when you integrate out this f and you get a potential, which is essentially f, f squared, okay, then, then the potential, again, if there wasn't this non-renormalizable term, it would have just looked like lambda to the fourth. Um, but uh, because of this little thing here, I, I get 1 minus um, sigma squared over m squared. OK? And, uh, and it's worth just approximating this for small sigma. What, you'll see why in a second. It looks like lambda to the fourth, 1 plus sigma squared over m squared. And I'm sorry, this is all to be erased. OK? Now, what does the potential look like? Let's just see. Here's v. Here's sigma, the absolute value of sigma. Uh, it looks like, uh, like obviously, and this is lambda to the fourth. It, it, it obviously looks like this, where this is the scale m. And then the denominator blows up. And we're not surprised, we're not shocked. It's not terrible that the answer blows up when sigma gets as big as m, because clearly it's some sort of effective field theory, where we should be at energies below m in order to make sense of it. 
But it doesn't much matter. I don't care what's happening out here where I don't trust the effective theory. The, the minimum is obviously here at sigma equals 0. Okay? And that's why near there, you can see that the mass of the sigma particle that you get at this VEV is um, lambda squared uh, over m squared. And I leave it as an exercise for you to check that the mass of the fermion is actually just 0, strictly 0. So here are a few things. OK, so let me say one minute then, just to hit the punchline. The, the minimum has a vacuum energy which is positive. SUSY is broken. Of course, if SUSY is broken, fermi bose degeneracy should be broken. Yeah, it is. The mass of the boson is non-zero. The mass of the fermion is 0. And it's being 0. It's not just some random number. It's 0. That's because psi sigma, there's a Goldstone theorem for spontaneous breaking of SUSY, just like for regular symmetries. And, but, but, but it's a, but it's a, it's a fermionic Goldstone bose. It's a fermionic, it's a Goldstone fermion, which is usually <laughs> affectionately called Goldstino. OK. Um, that's it. We've, we've done spontaneous. This is some like a kind of a sigma model for SUSY breaking. And, uh, and in, when, when it's gauged by supergravity, the Goldstino is eaten and becomes the longitudinal components of the Gravitino. Good. I stop. Uh. <laughs> Questions. As I said, I would. I'm. I'm happy to be here at 6:30 or whenever you're. Or whenever it is that you're. You have a plan. Sorry. Sorry. There is an evening. Yeah. Just, I just need to know what. Like, what would people? What would? Before everybody disperses, like, what would be a reason? Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, so maybe I don't know. I'm, I might just go have some time after class, like even tomorrow, and then we just go till whatever. I had a very quick question. Yeah. Do we need to maintain locality in the fifth dimension? Because all the theories that are seen have seen that locality. Yeah. And uh, yes. And, and um, uh, what do you have to do? Good reason. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, there's actually, no, no, I, 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 sorry, this actually was, is, came up and, and, and I argued it in my review of ADS-CFT, but I can tell you the answer quickly. Because if you, if X5 is rotatable into X, right, we definitely have ro locality in X, and that, just from the fact that it's rotatable, it, it inherits that. So that's the quick answer. You can, but only so if you then violate 5D rotational invariance. So as long as it's not an SO1 for something that... In other words, the thing that makes it a dimension like ours is because it's, symmetri it's symmetric with us. If you don't give me that, anything goes. Think of it as temperature or color or something like I said yesterday. Yeah, I just want to clarify this uh, Grassmann number. So here it looks like the entire population doesn't care about the, what the range of this alpha beta can be, right? Yeah, so these are just standard Grassmann integrals, which are exactly, yeah, so it's, you see, they don't have a range. You see, theta is not a number that goes from 0 to 1. It's right, a formal is, device. But alpha is. Alpha, alpha. So alpha. Alpha is the index yeah. of theta. So mean, right? Oh, yeah, that, but that just goes from 1 to 2. 1 to 2. Why, why is that the case? Because they're only like the, the number of thetas is matching the number of Qs, right? And these are